Thanks for joining us for this symposium. I'm Bill Rapisi, President and CEO of the Lymphatic Education Research Network. Lauren's mission is to fight lymphatic diseases through education, research, and advocacy. In order to win a fight, you first have to join it. So we ask, please become a supporting member of LEARN at lymphaticnetwork.org. And we hope you enjoy today's symposium. Well, good morning, everyone. I believe everywhere in our, in our reach, it's still morning. Uh, welcome again to this online symposium related to a human drug trial that is imminently to be launched at Stanford. I wanna welcome back those of you that uh, participated uh, two weeks ago. This is a follow-on uh, symposium to what we talked about two weeks ago, uh, and I'll get into the material in just a moment. Before I do so, I want to acknowledge the generous support of LEARN's sponsors that help this webinar series to, um, to uh, able, be able to be taking place. And uh, an important disclaimer that this uh, information is provided for use with you in consultation with your healthcare professional, and we're not attempting to take the place of your physician or healthcare providers. I also want to remind everyone before I get into the material that um, there is a Q&A function in the Zoom, and we ask that you please submit your questions in that Q&A section and not in the chat portion uh, of, of, the, of the application. Uh, last time, two weeks ago, we had over 150 questions and I apologize that I was not able to get to the majority of them, but today, the bulk of the time that I've allotted for this event will be to answer your questions once I present the material. So I'm hoping that we perhaps do a slightly better job in terms of getting your specific uh, questions answered. So um, many of you participated two weeks ago. Some of you perhaps are tuning in for the first time. For the prior participants, this will be a little bit of review. For those of you that were not present before, just a context for the pragmatic talk that we're going to have today, which is um, the fact that over the last 25 years or so, I've been on a path to develop a drug that might reverse and prevent lymphedema. Um, and um, that uh, quest is based on the fact that lymphedema starts as a so-called pitting edema in which it's primarily fluid-based and we have lots of manual therapies and some drugs to address this component of lymphedema. But unfortunately, as many of you know, lymphedema tends to progress to a so-called irreversible stage where we begin to see progressive accumulation of tissue changes in the affected parts of the body that no longer become responsive to the manual therapies and all of the modalities that we have to manage lymphedema and therefore uh, remains in essence an untreatable uh, problem. We have relied on um, experiments in mouse models of lymphedema to make many of these discoveries, but have been able to successfully cross over uh, into the human treatment uh, platform. And in all of this work, uh, what we eventually learned is that lymphedema appears to be an unrelenting inflammatory condition of the skin. Lymph uh, inflammation is very much, I use the metaphor of an automobile. You can say you have an automobile, but that automobile might be a Lexus, it might be a Tesla, it might be a Honda, it might be a Ford. And if you have a Tesla, you're not going to take your car to a Honda dealer to fix it. You're going to take it to a Tesla um, uh, service center. And so in that sense, it becomes very important to understand what is the modality of inflammation that is being utilized by the body to drive the particular inflammatory process. And what we learned early on in our work is that this enzyme, which is present in tissues throughout the body, seems to be the one that is responsible for what is happening in the tissues. And ultimately, uh, we determined that um, out of all of this complex pathway, it is this particular molecule, which is a downstream product of activation of this enzyme that seems to be driving the lymphedema. And when these um, 
levels in the blood and in the tissues of this particular molecule, LTB4, become elevated, the body's ability to regenerate lymphatics and to heal the lymphatic system is, uh, is, seems to be somewhat irretrievably altered. And this is what allows lymphedema to develop and to move forward uh, with the passage of time. So um, recently we attempted to study a, an antagonist of this pathway in a trial called ULTRA. And while we saw very many beneficial responses in that trial, um, for financial reasons, the trial was not able to be carried out to its conclusion. We needed to study 250 patients in order to test the hypothesis that the drug was working, and we were able to only enroll 50 or 55. So the trial is inconclusive, uh, and I've been asked for months and years since that trial began, how long it would take for that trial to be over so that we could release the drug. And unfortunately, we didn't get there. But I want to tantalize you, and I showed this data a couple of uh, uh, weeks ago. This was one of the patients enrolled in the trial who received the active drug in this placebo-controlled trial. This was her leg prior to enrollment. She had to stop her uh, active work as a critical care nurse because of her unrelenting problems with lymphedema. And this is her leg 18 months after taking the drug and stopping the drug. She only took it for six months. And, and thereafter, her leg was significantly resolved. She wears a light compression garment, and that's about it. And so this gives us a lot of enthusiastic promise for the fact that this uh, modality could actually be beneficial in treating lymphedema, and we hope one day preventing lymphedema. And so moving forward to our current clinical trial, what I want to say before I begin is that this is an FDA uh, overseen trial. We are uh, going to be testing a drug that is at this moment an investigational agent, meaning it has not yet been approved by the FDA to be sold in your local drugstore. And in order to do research on an investigational drug, it is a very onerous bureaucratic process. I am the principal investigator, which um, means that I sit at the center of this very complicated map, and you can see all of the um, recording and observation and reporting that I have to do in a wide variety of directions to be in compliance with the FDA, with the federal government, with my local institution, and to ascertain that I am not harming anyone and that I am collecting the data in a way that um, will ultimately allow the FDA to make a decision about whether this drug uh, should be approved for clinical use. So I want everybody to understand how very complex this kind of human clinical research is. But at a, at a patient um, participant level, it's quite simple. And that's what I'm going to talk about today and, and hopefully encourage those of you that are appropriate subjects to consider uh, participating uh, in this trial if you can. So um, clinical trials these days often have catchy acronyms and uh, we decided we needed one as well. So we're calling this the HEAL trial, which stands for Human Lymphedema Acebilostat trial. So the human lymphedema part makes sense. The trial part makes sense. Acebilostat is the generic name of the drug that we will be testing uh, in this protocol. Acebilostat is a very specific antagonist of LTB4. As I said, it's an investigational drug, uh, which means it is not available for commercial use, but it has been used in about 400 human subjects thus far in a variety of contexts, including uh, testing in healthy individuals for its safety. And it has been used in at least a couple of published clinical trials, one in cystic fibrosis, a second one that I believe is not published yet, but was carried out at Stanford um, in, in COVID, in fact. And what we know about this drug is it appears to be extraordinarily safe. Uh, it has a very, very light, low side effect profile, and therefore, we're very um, optimistic that if it does what we want it to do, that we'll be able to use it safely in lymphedema. All clinical trials have inclusion and exclusion criteria. So the inclusion criteria for our HEAL trial is single arm lymphedema. Now, I've explained this before a couple of weeks ago, and I will say it again. 
because I often get angry responses or, or frustrated responses from patients with lymphedema in other parts of the body to say, why are you only interested in arm lymphedema? I have leg lymphedema. I have le uh, head and neck lymphedema. I have lymphedema of my breast and so on. Um, the issue is it's not that we're more interested in arm lymphedema, but lymphedema in the arm is the most homogeneous presentation that we have. The patients all resemble one another to a very large extent, both in terms of how they got the lymphedema and, and the, the severity of the lymphedema, the distribution of the lymphedema. And as I mentioned a couple of weeks ago, when we do mouse studies, we're doing studies on mice that are effectively identical twins. And so they are as alike to one another as any two biological specimens can be. And that means that we can draw conclusions from relatively small number of observations. We're trying to do the same thing in a human lymphedema trial, but the variability among subjects will dictate that we need more and more and more subjects to, uh, to observe until we can make a statistically valid conclusion. So we can do this study on the smallest number of people we believe if we do it in the arm. Our intent is not to develop a drug for arm lymphedema. It is a, to develop a drug for all lymphedema, arm, leg, breast, genital, head and neck, any place that lymphedema occurs, children, adults, primary, secondary, but we're trying to get to the end point as quickly as we can. And that's why this is an arm lymphedema trial. Um, now, the patients who present to us for inclusion have to have had lymphedema for at least six months. They can be males or females, but of course, because arm lymphedema is chiefly a problem of breast cancer treatment, we know that this trial will be uh, involving predominantly and possibly even exclusively females, depending on how many male patients uh, present for enrollment. Uh, this is a, a study in adult patients. So if uh, the individual is more than 18 years of age, and they have to be um, no older than 75 at the time that they enroll in the study. Even if they will turn 76 during the enrollment, they have to be 75 or less at the time that they enroll. Now, what happens if you participate? Well, the first thing that will happen is that you'll be fully evaluated prior to your formal enrollment. So we will initially gather information from you at a distance to determine that you really are the right kind of person to potentially be considered for this trial. And on the visit that will result in your enrollment, after you sign the informed consent document, we will do a full physical and laboratory evaluation uh, to be certain that you're an appropriate person to participate. Um, as I've said, there is an informed consent uh, document that you sign that makes sure that you understand everything that we're going to do and why we're doing it and why we're not doing other things and what the uh, implicit risks are, if any, and what the potential benefits may be, what your alternatives are. We will typically send you an electronic copy of this informed consent when we uh, determine that you are a potential candidate so you can review it in advance, talk it over with your healthcare providers. And when you come to the initial visit, we will uh, have you sign a paper version of that informed consent before we do anything else. Once you're enrolled in the trial, you will be carefully monitored throughout the study duration, which is nine months. Um, you will have the opportunity to withdraw your participation voluntarily at any time that you choose. That's true of any clinical trial. It is our hope that if you start the trial, you will conclude it. But if there's a reason that you need to withdraw and you don't have to defend your reason to us, uh, we will certainly comply with that request. Now, you will have the opportunity to experience any of the potential benefits of the investigational drug. And of course, this might be years before it's released for general commercial use. I can't make any promises, but you saw the one patient that I showed you who got the investigational drug in the prior trial. She continues to experience the benefit that she achieved during the trial. And it's now been over two years since she last had a dose of 
the investigational drug. We cannot guarantee this, but this is one of the potential benefits. Now, this trial, the one that we're currently doing, unlike the prior trial, is not placebo controlled. Everybody who enrolls in this trial will get the active drug uh, during the time of their duration. So that is a potential benefit, one that we can't guarantee, but one that we can offer as an option. And I need to say in a more philanthropic sense that any individual who participates in clinical trials is doing something to help the general medical community from which they are drawn. So if you participate in this study, you may or may not achieve benefit from this uh, participation, but you will certainly help us move one step closer toward finding an answer for lymphedema for the general community. What won't happen if you participate, as I've said, we cannot guarantee any favorable lymphedema outcome from your participation because that's the purpose of the trial is to find out whether that's going to happen. We will not be able to reimburse you for any personal expenses accrued on the basis of your participation. When I have performed trials in the past, whether it was the ultra trial or my earlier work with ketoprofen, I've literally had people fly into Stanford from all over the country. Um, and that is a wonderful, generous thing for somebody to do both for themselves and for the general community. But we cannot provide the resources for you to come from a distance. That's on your own dime, so to speak. However, you will not incur any medical expenses for your participation. Everything that we do is independent of any third party payer, independent of any cash flow from your own uh, finances. We pay for everything that we do when you participate in the trial. Here is a formal synopsis of what the trial looks like and its official title is a pilot uh, trial of ACE Bilistat for the treatment of human upper extremity lymphedema. Now, I mentioned this is an open label trial, and it is. Everybody will be treated with the drug, but during some time during your participation, for a brief period of time, you will also receive placebo. Uh, but um, the intent of the trial is for everybody to receive the active drug and make some comparisons for the short duration in which the placebo is administered. Um, it is indicated for unilateral upper extremity lymphedema, that's lymphedema of one arm only. We're going to try to determine the effect of this drug specifically on the responses of the skin and the structures under the skin to the drug. And we will be uh, monitoring that both by doing repetitive ultrasounds of uh, the skin of the involved, involved limb, as well as measuring the thickness of the skin with calipers. This is completely a non-invasive study. For those of you that are familiar with my older work in the past, we have used skin biopsies as part of our study, but we will be doing nothing invasive here. We will be drawing blood uh, and we will be doing these measurements from the outside. Um, each uh, individual will receive the drug for 24 weeks or six months. We intend to enroll 70 patients in this study. And um, as I said, this is a non-randomized trial. So to summarize, all participants will receive active drug. There is no randomization to placebo. There are four required study visits. These occur at three month intervals over nine months. So time zero, and then every three months up to the end of nine months. These must occur at Stanford. And I showed you the very beginning, there's a lot of uh, documentation that I need to do for the FDA. And this has to be performed uh, under my direct uh, observation with the uh, modalities that we have specifically here at Stanford. As I said, this is a non-invasive study. We'll be measuring arm volumes, thickness of the skin, using calipers, using ultrasound. We will obtain blood specimens at regular intervals through the trial. And part of the, um, the intent of that um, uh, collection of blood is that later on, we'll be doing molecular studies to try to understand even better how this drug is working and potentially to refine our treatment even further. So to go into the inclusion criteria in a little more detail, uh, it's uh, one arm involved, at least six months chronic lymphedema. If anyone has previously had any surgery for lymphedema, and I know this is increasingly being used in our center and elsewhere, this is okay, but at least one year must have elapsed prior to the screening time, sorry, prior to the surgery. So at the time of screening, it needs to be at least a year 
uh, since the surgery. And then we need to be able to document that there's enough residual lymphedema that you're still a candidate uh, to be enrolled in the trial. And uh, everybody, of course, needs to be able to read that informed consent document, understand it, and be able to sign it in a knowledgeable way. Here are some things that can't be present for somebody to be in the trial. Um, if you have lymphedema, but you haven't completed your initial physical therapy at least eight weeks prior to enrollment, you can't be enrolled at that point. We can certainly wait for you to finish all of that. And if we're still enrolling at that point, yes, you can be enrolled once your initial uh, treatment has been completed. Um, we allow you to do everything that you currently do for your lymphedema. If you use a pneumatic compression device, you can continue to use it. If you use a garment at night, you can continue to use it. If you wear a specific daytime garment, yes, you can. And we want you to continue to use it. We don't want you to add or subtract anything that you're doing at the time that we make your initial evaluation. Those are all of the supportive things that you're doing for your lymphedema. What we want to know is how the drug alters your response to those things. So we don't want you to suddenly introduce a pneumatic compression device that's going to change the volume of your limb potentially and us assume that it's the drug that's done that. Anybody who's planning to have surgery during the six months that they would otherwise be enrolled in the trial, of course, will not be able to be enrolled. Um, we cannot allow for any other medical condition that might um, create or be uh, a participant in the uh, edema that we're evaluating. So we will evaluate you for all of those things. And anybody who is pregnant or nursing will be excluded from participation. So. I'm going to conclude what I have to say formally by saying that I have a tremendous amount of hope for this drug class and specifically for ACE Bilistat. We are extraordinarily excited. We think that we're doing something really dramatic for the patient population. We need your help. We cannot get this drug to market unless those of you that are candidates participate. And as I've said, if you are a candidate and you are able to come to Stanford and you do want to do this um, over a, a nine month period of time, then um, you stand the opportunity to be reaping the benefits of this drug months and years before it may be available to the general population. If you're not able to come or you have a kind of lymphedema that doesn't fit into what I've just talked about, don't despair. We're doing this for you as well. But for those of you that can be participants, uh, we believe that um, it's going to be extraordinarily important for you to, to help us get to the end goal here. Now, for those of you that are actively uh, interested. You may not be sure that you are or you're not, or you may have specific questions about yourself and your candidacy. The very best way to get into the roster of people to be enrolled is to contact my clinical coordinator. Many of you have talked to her in the past. Her name is Les Roche, and you see her um, email address here on the screen. Um, write this down if you think you're interested. This is the best way to get in touch with us. We will answer all of your questions. At some point, if it's appropriate, we will send you the informed consent document um, for you to review. And then if it is all still appropriate, we will have you uh, come to Stanford on a specified appointment date so that we can start the process of potentially enrolling you uh, in the trial. I hope all of you have written it down. If, if not, I'll, I'll project it at the end, but I'm now going to uh, open the Q&A um, function and try to answer um, uh, this, the questions that are being asked. Somebody wanted to know why we chose to use ACE Bilistat rather than continuing uh, Bistatin. There are a couple of reasons. The most important reason is that the pharmaceutical sponsor that was involved with uh, Bistatin uh, has gone in a different direction and is really not interested in exploring lymphedema further. Um, that would be a pragmatic answer. I think um, an important additional answer is to tell you that Bistatin, it turns out, was an LTA4 hydrolase antagonist, but in a somewhat nonspecific way in that it was a more general, um, what an enzyme called an amino peptidase that acted on the enzyme of interest and many others. The drug that we are, are going to be utilizing is a very specific 
directed antagonist of LTA4 hydrolase. So as we hone in further and further on what we're trying to do, this is actually uh, a better drug, uh, I will say. Um, and um, there's a question the same person asked if this would be uh, potentially uh, useful in primary lymphedema in patients who have uh, may or may not have VEGF-related genetic mutations. We don't have insight into that yet. What I can tell you is from my early work with ketoprofen, which works much higher up in the chain of enzymatic processes that lead to LTB4 production, we did see responsiveness in primary lymphedema. And I have at least anecdotal experience with a small number of patients who have congenital lymphedema. And uh, while we don't know necessarily the, um, the genetic substrate of that lymphedema, we believe that this might be a treatment that is useful across the, uh, the spectrum of, of lymphedema presentations. We certainly, um, we certainly believe that uh, it is um, going to be useful at least in pediatric patients. Um, there's a question if bistatin is commercially available anywhere outside of Japan. The answer is no. And for those of you that think you're going to call a cousin in Japan or go over there and buy the drug, because I've been asked that many, many times, they are much stricter about drugs than we are, are in the United States. And you would need to live there and you would need to have the specific clinical indication for which they use it in Japan, which is really as a supportive intervention in cancer. Um, so bottom line is no, bistatin is not really the route to being treated. The route to being treated is to help us get to this goal and, and, and get ace bilistat commercially available. Um, so another question, have we seen any indication that LTB4 antagonists have any effect on primary vascular valvular incompetence? Not on the valves themselves, but we have reason to believe that what we are doing with the drug is altering the tissue response to whatever it is that's causing the lymphedema. So in principle, even a lymphedema that is based on a valvular incompetence in the lymphatics should potentially, uh, in theory, be responsive to this kind of drug therapy. Is the medication a steroid? No, it is not a steroid. It is, a, it is in a unique class of drugs that specifically interact just with this one enzyme that we're interested uh, in, in, um, in hampering its activity. Um, to make an analogy for you, a steroid, if you think of it as an anti-inflammatory drug, is like chopping down a tree. There may be a diseased branch on the tree, but you're chopping down the whole tree to get rid of the diseased branch. Using a drug like isbilistat is is like cutting off a very small branch, the part of the tree that has the problem. Um, so I think this is, e e steroids don't particularly work in lymphedema and they carry a broad spectrum of side effects. And this is a much preferable way uh, to treat the problem because we are targeting specifically what we think is wrong at the tissue level. Um, okay, let's see. Um, so somebody wanted to know, are there medical conditions or medications that preclude participation? The medication part is easy. We don't allow any drug that is active in the same broad 5-LO pathway that we're going to be working in. And chiefly speaking, that means if you happen to already be taking ketoprofen, you have to stop it. Uh, and you have to be off it long enough for us to know it's not doing anything at the time that we enroll you. The only other drug that seems to be relevant to this concern is one called Montelukast or Singulair, which is actually an LTC4 antagonist. Uh, and people typically take that for asthma. So anybody who's taking Montelukast who cannot stop it um, would need to... Um, would need to uh, not be able to participate. There are some other uh, scattered drugs that have the potential to interact with ACE bilistat, and we would need to review that on a case-by-case -case basis. And there's a situation where if you contact us, we'll ask you what medications you're taking, everything about your presentation to help us understand if you are at least theoretically a, a potential participant. Um, medical conditions that preclude participation, well, number one is active cancer. 
uh, we, we really need the cancer to be off the table by the time uh, we're going to enroll you in the trial. Uh, as I mentioned, any, any other condition that might cause your arm to swell independent of what caused the lymphedema would also be an exclusionary um, element. Um, are there existing LTB4 inhibitors uh, that are FDA approved that could be used? The answer is no, there are none. As I mentioned, the asthma medicines are LTC4 antagonists. They will have no effect here. And we've tested them in the animal model. Um, this is a very specific targeted pathway and there are no current approved active agents to antagonize this pathway. That's why we need to do this trial. Um, what if you have one arm and two legs with lymphedema? Are you a candidate? No, I'm sorry. You have to have lymphedema only of one arm. If you have leg edema on another basis and it's not lymphedema, um, the, that's potential possibility. We, we would need to evaluate that, but um, there can only be a single arm involvement and no other involvement with lymphedema. Why the upper age limit? I'm sorry. This is kind of coming from the FDA uh, in part. What we need to, um, because how can I say this in a, in a very uh, philosophically correct way? The higher the number that represents your age, the more likely you are to potentially incur other medical conditions simply by virtue of your age. And we need the slate to be as clean as possible during the trial enrollment, because if something else happens to the subject during the time that they are involved in the trial, until proven otherwise, that something else is considered to be a potential complication of drug therapy. And that could mean that we are not able to provide this drug to the general population because somebody um, gave us data that was faulty. And now that, that, is of course not fair to the individual who's 80 years old and otherwise completely healthy and will be healthy for the next nine months. But statistically speaking, we need to keep things as clean as possible. That's the main reason. Do you have to reside in the US to be in the trial? No, not specifically. Uh, I think you, this individual said that uh, she lives in the UK. I think it's an onerous proposition to fly from the UK to the San Francisco Bay Area uh, four times over nine months. And there may be some other considerations um, that um, make it difficult for an international participant. But in principle, no, you don't need to live here, but you do need to be able to come back and forth to Stanford. Um, and I've already answered that question. Let's see. Um, Based on prior research, is the hypothesis that ACE Bilostat will be effective in lymphedema patients regardless of time from onset of lymphedema? Yes, absolutely. What we learned, um, what we learned about this study, or I'm sorry, what we learned about this drug interaction from ketoprofen is in the published ketoprofen trial, we had some participants that had had lymphedema for as long as six decades and still responded favorably to the drug intervention. So while we don't know with certainty that ACE Bilostat will replicate everything that we saw with ketoprofen on a theoretical basis, uh, we, we believe so. That's why we're doing this trial. So duration of lymphedema is not a concern. Um, the length of the trial is nine months from uh, date of initial enrollment to completion of the trial. Um, the ACE Bilostat will be provided by us. It's an investigational drug and you take it once a day as a pill. Um, if a person meets all of the selection, but also had an LVA or lymph node transfer within the past couple of years, does that disqualify them for participating in the study? No, as long as that surgery was accomplished more than one year prior to the date of initial enrollment, and provided that there are enough residual changes of lymphedema that qualify the individual to be enrolled in the study, they have lymphedema still of sufficient magnitude, then they can absolutely participate. Um, so um, the dosage and, and frequency of the drug is 100 milligrams uh, orally once daily, but as I've said, it's not commercially available. There is no place that you can get this. 
uh, except by helping us complete the trial so that we can put it in your local Walgreens or CVS or wherever you get your medications. Will there be any additional drugs used? No, not for this trial. I don't know what will happen in the future. It's possible we'll use a multimodal approach, but for now, this is a single drug uh, administration, as we've seen with both uh, Ubenimex or Bistatin and previously Ketoprofen, single drug therapy can be effective uh, at, at reversing these problems. Um, are there any things we will be asked not to do if we participate, for example, travel and hiking and so on? No, there will be no restrictions. The restrictions that I mentioned are, we don't want you to start doing something for your lymphedema that you're not already doing when we enroll you. And we please ask that you not stop doing anything that you're doing when you are enrolled. So if you're using a pump, if you're using a nighttime garment, if you're using a specific rate of compression, if you're using uh, anything to, if you're, if you're jumping on a rebounder, whatever it is you're doing, keep doing it because we don't really want to muddy the waters and assume that anything that you subtract is actually making the drug not work nor do we want to think that if you add in a pneumatic compression device that we've magically made your lymphedema better when the drug hasn't done that. Will there be more trials for lower limb? Um, yes, most certainly there will be. Uh, we are, like I said, we are very interested in the broad spectrum of lymphedema. And it is very likely that as we move forward, we will do something like we did with ketoprofen, which is to take all comers, arms, legs, children, adults, primary, secondary, but we first need a very targeted, quick ability to be able to tell the FDA, look, this drug works. It makes lymphedema better. Uh, and, and, um, and then we can move forward with additional studies. Some of the things that I'm interested in in the long term, beyond simply does this, does this drug work for lymphedema, I'm very interested to see and I have hypothetical reasons to believe that if we use this drug in people that are going to have some of the lymphedema microsurgeries, that the uh, surgical outcome might actually be improved because we improve the ability of the lymphatic vasculature to respond to that surgery in a favorable way. I certainly believe that this drug could be useful in preventing lymphedema in high-risk patients. And we have some molecular data from our ultra work to make us believe that there are specific biomarkers that tell us who is likely to respond to these kinds of drugs favorably. That's something we need to develop more, but we will eventually potentially be able to screen, for example, surgical uh, uh, sorry, breast cancer survivors and other cancer survivors to find out if they should be taking this drug prophylactically to prevent uh, lymphedema. Uh, and um, I, believe and based on some of the empiric observations that I have in the treated populations that we've already worked with, that this drug is likely to be very effective in preventing cellulitis in people who have lymphedema. And that will probably uh, in all likelihood be a study endpoint that we will look at in the future. Um, so these are all very encouraging avenues to, to follow, but um, suffice it to say that um, it is an arduous path to develop a new drug. And I've been at this since um, about the year 2000. Uh, I feel like we are almost at the crest of the hill now, uh, but it's taken a long time and we have to do things in a methodical way. So if you're a candidate, please, please, please enroll in this trial so that we can get on to these next questions. Um, Somebody asked how long it will be uh, until this drug is available. Well, this trial is likely to go on for two years, uh, maybe less if everybody enrolls very briskly. Uh, and from there, we'll need to see how the FDA uh, handles things. Um, can you use octreotide to treat um, uh, protein-losing enteropathy at the same time of using ace bilostat? In principle, yes. The octreotide is not the problem. The problem is that that sounds like a very complex lymphatic presentation. And it's likely that that individual would be excluded just on the basis of the broad distribution of the lymphatic abnormality, not the, atri not, not the octreotide. It's really what the octreotide is, is treating. Um, 
So somebody wants to know, if you participate, do you need to go to Stanford for the follow-ups? Yes, the follow-ups occur every three months and those are mandatory. If you know at the outset that you can only come one time, we cannot enroll you. We need to be sure in order to gather the data that the FDA wants and that we want, that we want um, that we see you every three months. All of the follow-up testing will be done at those visits. There's nothing in between those visits, but those visits are mandatory. Uh, secondary lymphedema only? No, if it is any lymphedema of a single arm, we can enroll you, but it has to be just one arm and there can be no other evidence of lymphedema uh, in the system. Um, and again, somebody asked, so I'm gonna repeat it, yes, Every three months at Stanford, there is time zero where you come here, we examine you, we evaluate your limb and we evaluate your medical history. And if you are a candidate, we will then do all of the formal measurements and give you the drug so that you can start to take it at home every day. And you take it at home every day for three months and then you come back and we will repeat everything we did on time zero and we'll give you another three months of the drug and you go home and then at six months you come back and we do everything we did at three months and we give you another three months of drug and you go home and you take it every day. And at nine months, you come back the last time we do the final set of measurements and then, um, and then you're good to go. Then you have completed the trial and if you've gotten better, we will hope that, um, that you will remain better and we will aggregate your data with everybody else's and eventually we'll report everything to the FDA. How do I participate if I don't stay in the US? Well, I think I've answered that already. I'm afraid that's not really feasible. You'll have to wait until, um, until we make this drug available internationally. Um, Okay. If you've had lymphedema for several years, can you participate? Absolutely. You can have had your lymphedema for decades, as long as you meet the inclusion criteria. Uh, are there any drug interactions to be aware of? Nothing of any major concern, other than the fact, as I mentioned, we don't want to use other drugs that are active in the same pathway. Um, Somebody wants to know if we will consider Canadians. If you can travel here and if there are no restrictions based upon the international uh, situation, then yes, we can, we can consider. You don't have to be a U.S. citizen, but um, uh, there, there are certain logistics that we have to work through. By all means, contact us if you're interested. We'll see if we can make it work. Um, so I had a weekly manual lymphatic drainage PT appointment this week. If I stop going to PT, can I apply or will I be too late after waiting eight weeks? You're not too late. You can enroll anytime in the next two years. I wanna make it clear that all we're asking is that before you present with your arm lymphedema, that you have completed your clinical intervention with a lymphedema therapist to get the maintenance physical modalities in place and that at least eight weeks have gone by since that happened. You can keep going to see your lymphedema therapist, but if you go weekly and that's your norm, we want you to continue to go weekly all during the nine months of your enrollment. We don't want you to do that just prior to seeing us and then stop because we won't be able to evaluate what changes are related to that therapy intervention versus the drug. So everything you're doing before you come, keep doing it. Anything you're not doing, don't start it. And make sure that at least eight weeks have transpired from your initial lymphedema treatment by a physical therapist. Will a placebo controlled study be undertaken if this open label study meets its endpoint? We don't know yet, but in all likelihood we, we will be going on to other fully placebo controlled um, studies. This one, as I mentioned, is open label, meaning everybody gets the drug. At some point, we might have to blindly randomize people to, um, to active drug versus placebo. 
Um, due to AFib, I cannot take ibuprofen. Would this knock me out of the study? No, absolutely not. It is all of the problems with non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs that motivate me to find a safer drug that can be used in a broader patient population. There are no cardiovascular contraindications to ACE Bilostat. So um, the fact that you cannot take um, ibuprofen or one of the other drugs that people might choose to now, I, I want to say ibuprofen does not help lymphedema, but I, ibuprofen is related to ketoprofen, which does help lymphedema. If you can't take ketoprofen because you have cardiovascular disease, um, you can still take ACE Bilostat. There is no contraindication. Do I have an estimated time when the trial would start? We are currently targeting something between Valentine's Day and the 1st of March. We have one more document that we need to get from the FDA before we can officially start enrolling uh, uh, subjects. We have been working on this process of approval by the FDA and by the Stanford IRB since last March. It's taken nine months and um, we are ready to go. We have one more letter that we need from the FDA. As soon as we get that, we are ready to go. Everything is in place. Uh, how do you define onset of lymphedema? Um, onset of lymphedema is most importantly defined by the patient. When you know that your arm has started to become abnormal, and in retrospect, that starting abnormality progressed to what you currently have, that's when your lymphedema started. We're not worried about when it started We're in, in this trial. We're worried about how severe it is. Is it severe enough to give us something to measure? over time? And are you at least eight weeks out from being treated? You may have waited three years from onset to see a lymphedema therapist for the first time. That doesn't matter. We just want to make sure that it's been at least eight weeks since you did that. Uh, when do we expect the study will begin? I think I just answered that sometime between the middle of February and the beginning of March. Uh, are there any key medical exclusions um, the only ones are the ones that I uh, mentioned earlier, which is you can't have another medical condition that is likely to make your arm swell outside of lymphedema. You can't be taking medications that are contraindicated. You can't have lymphedema in other parts of your body. Um, other than that, there are, and, and you cannot have active cancer. Other than that, most everything else is admissible in this trial. Will the possibility of recurrence of breast cancer make me ineligible for this trial? I've been cancer-free for 15 years. No, absolutely to the contrary. You are a cured cancer survivor and you're the kind of patient we want in this trial. We don't want to incur the likelihood of cancer recurrence early on after treatment. So we're going to be looking at that in terms of making certain that you're um, stable from a cancer survivor perspective, and we cannot enroll individuals who have active cancer. I have no lymph nodes under my left arm. Would I still be able to apply? Absolutely. As long as you have lymphedema, that meets all the criteria we've talked about. Any exclusions based on current medications or any supplements being taken? I think I've addressed this. It's mainly Montelukast uh, and non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs like ketoprofen. Um, you mentioned that there was some testing of the drug in relation to COVID. Has there been any testing regarding possible interaction with COVID vaccines that we have received? No testing of that. As far as we know, there are no drugs that interact with the COVID vaccines. Those are um, a completely different category of medical intervention. And um, the vaccines have a self-limited impact uh, in the body and no reason to think about that. Of course, you're gonna wanna be fully vaccinated uh, in this time in, in life in order to be traveling back and forth to a hospital and doing all these things that we're doing, but COVID is really off the table with regard to this. What is the time frame for this? Well, as I mentioned, we're launching the trial within the next two to three weeks. Um, we will take as long as it takes to enroll 70 subjects and get them to the point that they have completed their nine months of enrollment. We hope that we will be at a stage of completed enrollment if all goes well by latest next, uh, the summer of, of 2023, and then we will quickly analyze the data and present it to the FDA. What stage of uh, lymphedema is eligible, eligible stage two or greater? Um, 
So uh, if there's nothing detectable visibly, we can't enroll you because we have nothing uh, to measure. That doesn't mean you don't have lymphedema. It's just that we, we have to have a starting point of something that's abnormal that we can measure that we can then track over time and show that it's gotten better. What was success rate in phase one number of participants and how they're doing now? Well, phase one includes, I believe, more than 100 patients who received the drug. Well, I shouldn't say they're patients, they're subjects who are normal just to look at safety and toxicity. And that study was overwhelmingly negative, meaning that it did not show any serious adverse events uh, for the drug. Um, which is why it's gone on to phase two testing in COVID and cystic fibrosis and now in lymphedema. We think it's a very safe drug with a very low side effect profile, comparable to the kinds of things that you buy over the counter that you currently use in your body that don't require a prescription. I have lymphedema on my right side, including my right arm, but not my left. This was from breast cancer surgery. Does having in the trunk on the right side eliminate my participation? No, as long as it's a single arm and not involving the other limbs. Um, is there any scope that this may be branched out to other lymphatic disorders? I have undiagnosed chylocystitis. I am on acyclovir and it has slowed the rate of fluid accumulation, but no one can explain why. The answer is, Possibly, yes. Um, we don't know enough about the impact of this drug yet on, uh, on these visceral lymphatic um, uh, diseases. What I will say is very often when it comes to lymphatic abnormalities inside of the body, there is an internal lymphedema component that accompanies abnormalities that are physically present in the lymphatic circulation. It's unlikely that ACE bilostat by itself will cure all of that. Um, and that maybe that a multimodal approach will be necessary, but the lymphedema, internal lymphedema component from whatever the underlying abnormality is could certainly respond uh, to this drug in a favorable way. Um, any anticipated side effects? No, none, none that we can project. I mean, the, every drug on the face of the earth has a side effect profile and Many of the many, many of the common things that people experience with drugs happen almost across the spectrum of drugs that are given. Headache, lethargy, difficulty sleeping, sleepiness, um, nausea, uh, changes in bowel habits. All of these things can happen with a broad variety of drug. We have no reason to say that this drug will do that with any greater or lesser likelihood, but there is nothing that we've identified that we would be looking for as a specific predictable side effect yet. Um, is there any estimation of therapy price if it reaches market? No, absolutely. And that would be well beyond my scope because I'm not on the business side of pharmacology. I'm only here to study the science. Um, if you had lymph bypass surgery in the past with no success, are you still considered a candidate? Absolutely, provided that it's been at least a year. Um, do I think anybody else will run a similar trial? No, no, this is our trial. This is our science. This is our connection to the sponsor that has access to the drug. So unfortunately for now, if you want to get open label ACE Bilostat, um, Stanford is the place to come. Now in the future, as we move forward, it is very possible and indeed likely that we will launch multi-center trials that where we will extend this science to other colleagues so that they can work in other parts of the country. But first we have to prove the concept. Um, I think at this point, we are pretty close to the end of our time. So um, I'm going to conclude by very briefly uh, trying to put that information back on the screen in case you missed it. Uh, this is the email address for the clinical coordinator for the trial. You will find her to be lovely and receptive and answer all of your questions and get you all of the information you need. Um, and she is in, in perpetual contact with me and we work together as a team. Um, so I encourage you to write down this email address and we will happily work with you uh, in the future if you are an appropriate candidate. I hope many of you can come to Stanford. I understand the geographical uh, and logistical problems involved, but 
as I've said, we want to help you individually and we want to help you collectively as a patient community. And these trials are definitely the way to do it. So thank you once again for your attention and for your enthusiasm about this trial. Let's hope that um, in the near future, we can talk about lymphedema as a very, very different kind of problem. Thanks very much and have a great day. Bye-bye.